Welcome to the Flower Essence Podcast and join us on an exploration of the healing wisdom of flowers. With combined decades of experience in the study and practice of flower essence therapy, I, Kathleen Aspens, and co-host Rokana Feld guide you to reconnect to nature with these potent vibrational remedies. Welcome to the Flower Essence Podcast. Welcome back to those who've been listening. And thank you so much for the positive feedback you've given us so far. We truly love doing this. I'm Rokana Feld. And on this podcast, we're going to change the format a little. Our topic is flower essences for pets. And since Kathleen is an expert in this area, I'm going to interview her. And I'm sure I'll be learning a lot right along with you. Kathleen Aspens has been a flower essence practitioner for over a decade, creating the Flora of Asia flower essence line in the process. What some people may not know is that in addition to working with people, she has an even longer history working with animals. She's trained in multiple animal wellness therapies and specializes in using flower essences for pets and their owners. So today, Kathleen, Maybe we could just start out with you telling us a little bit more about your background working with animals. I'd be happy to. Uh, Animals are always my first love. And I think that when I first started studying flower essences, I was really certain that I was only going to work with animals. And when I started to do the certification work, um, I I trained with Jane Bell and was certified through the Alaskan Flower Essence Project. When I first started to do that certification work, I really realized that it would be much easier for all of the paperwork and the case studies to do it with people. And so I first started working with people actually as part of the certification. And I discovered that I really loved it. It was quite a surprise to me. So I've always been interested in in working with animals. Um, Animals have been absolutely a first love from my very earliest memories. When I was a young girl, I thought that for sure I'd become a veterinarian uh, in high school. And then for almost 10 years after that, during that time and after, uh, I worked as a veterinary technician as a, um, with small animals and exotics. So I got a lot of experience in handling animals in that way. And it really, at some point I really realized that it was kind of hurting my heart to work with animals that way because so much of what's done in veterinary medicine is you're just kind of restraining them and doing treatments to them and using injections and all sorts of things. And there's a lot of times you're missing out on the sentience of the being and it's just a tough thing to do. Um, Medicine itself is kind of invasive to the body. Um, And I just really realized that that wasn't the right thing for me to do. um, And I moved on. Since then, I've trained extensively with Linda Tellington Jones uh, as a for an equine um, tea touch certification. And I absolutely adore that method. And it's just since since starting to work with her, I really recognized how aligned I am with her philosophy and her system because we're always working with the intelligence of the horse. And we're never forcing, we're never pressuring, we're always trying to work with the horse's ability to offer So I just feel like that was a wonderful reset for me to be able to recognize that there was a different way of working with animals that didn't involve force or coercion. Instead, we can work with the intelligence of the creature and help them live their lives better without with less conflict and fear. I think so much of of the behavior type work that we always think of with animals is about sort of managing problem behaviors. And there's a lot of coercion that happens there. It's a lot of, you know, shut up and do what I say. (laughs) And I think that it really relates to me personally because that was a lot of my upbringing that I was essentially treated like a non-sentient being and told to, you know, essentially shut up and do what I say. So I can really relate to how animals feel um, from just an absolute soul level of, I recognize this experience and I want to help things be better. 
And I think flower essences are just one more way that we can help our animals uh, feel better in themselves, overcome things like traumatic experiences. And those traumatic experiences can be just ordinary things like we think of um, an animal who was a shelter animal or a rescued animal. And their childhood was probably pretty traumatic if you just think about the reality of that. And so I think that working with animals with essences is a really natural fit um, and can really help enormously in some really common issues in the same way that it does with people. And I think that's really what astonished me when I first started working with people, that I started realizing just how much we overlap. I'd always looked at animals going, oh, this is what's going on. Oh, this is what's going on with, with him or her. And then realizing that people have the same feelings, have the same struggles and challenges. We just talk about them differently because we talk about them and animals just act. So by watching people and seeing what they're doing, I can kind of reverse engineer where the behavior is coming from. Oh, you had a tough childhood too. (laughs) That's really interesting. Can you tell us a little more about that tea touch method that you te- that you touched on? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's it's the stutter, the tea touch. Uh, Tellington touch is a type of body work essentially that was created by Linda Tellington Jones. She trained with Moshe Feldenkrais, and so a lot of the philosophy and the way that we work with the horses comes out of that work. So it's a very gentle form of body work that focuses on helping to restore healthy function to the movement, but also recognizes that through gentle movements of um, of the skin, essentially, we're really moving the skin rather than doing a deeper type of body work. We're able to unlock areas that have gotten stuck or were from pain and to help to release. So it releases on all the levels, on the physical, on the emotion, um, and also on the mental level for the horses. We're all one thing, right? You know, we're, we, we can have something stuck in our bodies, but it's also stuck in our emotions and it's also stuck in our mind. So tea touch is a, is a type of work that includes the body work, of which there's quite a lot, uh, and then also has some types of groundwork, and then there's also some written instruction. My practice is primarily in helping empower horse people to learn the body work because it's very it's a very gentle and accessible way of of working with the body so that they can be really empowered in working with their own animals and they develop these tools that they can always keep with themselves now is this something that can be used with other animals besides horses Yes, it's been wonderfully developed um, with other types of animals, companion animals. Uh, They hold trainings for dogs and cats and other companion animals. And there are people who are doing it with llamas and all sorts of other animals. So it's really, it works with all animals. And there's also a human form as well, of course, because we are animals too, right? The, um, the system, uh, my certification is with horses exclusively. So that's the sort of work that I practice. And do you combine flower essence therapy with that for the horses? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I think that it's it's something that I bring to everything that I do is the the notion and consciousness of how the flowers can help. So it's one of those things that you can layer in. And I know that there are a lot of other practitioners who do other types of, of therapies um, and add in flower essences because it's just so incredibly healing. I love to do flower essences for the animal and then also for the person because so often that there are a lot of overlapping issues. Right. And I've heard that, um, that taking, when you're giving your pet a flower essence, that the owner should take the same one. Is that exactly right? I think that it's really a good idea. Very often when I'm talking to somebody and, you know, sometimes the pet brings them to me, right? <laughs> the pets are pretty smart and they're like, I know how to get help for my person. And the, the person would come to me and ask about something for their pet. And we'd be working up the case on, on their pet and talk. And then I'd start talking about some of the essences that might be really useful, this essence and that essence and describing what they do. And then the person will you know, more often than not, we'll say, oh, that sounds like something I could use too. And 
you know, it's, it's just absolutely true that we are so aligned with our animals that very often the right essence for them is the right essence for us too. Isn't so that I, amazing? It, it is. It's astonishing if, if you don't really think about it. And if you think about it, you go, well, of course, yeah. you know, they share, they share our lives with us and they're so empathic and they absolutely are here to help us and take care of us uh, and to love us. And so they, they will take on things or oftentimes we will be attracted to animals that have similar issues so that we can start working them out. You know, if you're thinking about it kind of on a soul level, we develop partners to help us work out our issues. That makes a lot of sense to me. And you do hear about animals taking on the diseases of the owners, but that's a thought. That's a belief that some people have. What do you think about that? I think it does happen. I think that it's also, it's really tricky because then we're going to start dumping a bunch of guilt on top of the person. And you know, we're all just doing our best and the pets are doing their best too. And so sometimes we can have a conversation with the pet of, you know, you can let this go and you don't have to take it on. And there are essences that are very, very helpful for that. So that if you've got a situation where the pet is, is manifesting something and you're thinking, oh no, maybe, maybe I've given it to my pet or maybe they've taken it on for me in, in love and kindness, I guess. Um, and yet, you know, that would be, it's like our worst nightmare as somebody who loves our animals. I, I love to use pink yarrow, which is such a beautiful, um, sort of de enmesher, if that's a word, which I don't think it is, but it's one of those things that energetically we get really tightly aligned with our animals and they get it tightly aligned with us. And so using something like pink yarrow can help to sort of create a boundary between us, not a, not a boundary, like a wall, but a, this is my stuff. This is your stuff. I don't have to take on your stuff. I think pink yarrow is one of the most common essences that I reach for in situations of people and animals. Yeah. And people and people, because that's in any relationship. Right? <laughs> totally. Children and their parents yeah. and, you know, two spouses or coworkers, or, I mean, pink arrow is kind of like just universal. Just take pink arrow. Just please just take pink arrow. Yeah. So let's, um, I wanted to find out more about what and what conditions in animals are flower essences just really do well for. I, you know what, what don't they do well for? It's, it's sort of like with people, it, once you start really kind of opening up what the issue might be, then things start to become more clear. A lot of times, just because the way that we're trained Western thinking, we look at the symptom or the problem, you know, my dog is barking, make that stop. (laughs) And instead, what we'll do as part of a consultation and and sort of exploring the issue is, is when is he barking? Why is he barking? What is he trying to get out of this barking? And sometimes it starts to become quite clear that the issue is that they feel really insecure or that they're overstimulated. And all of those things, once you really kind of get down to the root of them, that's when you can start to become more um, precise in the use of essences and making sure that you're getting just the right ones for that. That makes a lot of sense, just like with working with people, getting to that root cause. Yeah, there are some nice kind of um, umbrella types of remedies that can be a good starting place where you can sort of see if it's if it's easily shifted, uh, then sometimes those those essences, like I love animal care from the Alaskan essences. That's such a great formula, just sort of as a, a blanket remedy. It was created by a veterinarian in Brazil um, using, you know, the formulas from the Alaskan essences. And I find that it's really, really a helpful sort of a crisis formula that you can kind of pull out whenever you have an animal crisis. And then when, you know, once you've kind of gotten through the crisis time and you can look a little more at what might be underlying that you can work with, that's when you might pull out some specific essences as well. With pets and animals. I mean, like you said, they, they don't speak. So sometimes it might be challenging to kind of figure out why they're feeling a certain way or, or why they might have be having a certain behavior. I mean, obviously if they're barking when the home, when the owner isn't home, I mean, they're missing the owner and they're feeling alone, I'm assuming. Right. So, 
Um, but maybe there's some that aren't so straightforward. And how do you kind of uh, determine what's going on with that animal? I think a lot of times they might not be straightforward because just from a, a description of, you know, the say just on this, on this topic of the pet sparking when you're not home, I think that it's important to look at the, the breeding of the animal, the genetics of the animal to see kind of a starting point. What was that dog bred to do? If you have a border collie who's in an apartment and they're barking all day, they pr might have a different motivation than maybe a small toy breed or some other kind of dog. So that can be a good starting point to kind of feel into what this animal's motivation might be. That's such a good point. I mean, there's dogs, sheep dogs that have been bred to bark all, you know, night long for chasing away, uh, keeping away predators. And there's guard dogs that have been bred to protect the homestead. So that makes a lot of sense. It's, it's so interesting, isn't it? That we, that a lot of times we just think of it as dog <laughs> if we don't know better. And then it's really helpful to recognize that just like, just like kids, you know, the one kid is not like another kid. They, one child might have a predilection for being the great organizer of a classroom and helping all the kids play along. And then maybe one kid just wants to be off the, by themselves, kind of getting into their own little experiments. And if you look at the, the dogs or, or other pets in the same way, they all have their, their reason for being here. You know, some of them are just really wanting to be with us and some of them love to have jobs. Um, so if you've got a dog that's, you know, maybe of a herding breed, they're accustomed to having a job and it's going to be really tough to turn them into um, a sofa um, lump <laughs> <laughs> and just want to like hang out all day and not really doing anything, anything. That's just not really what they're designed to do. But I, I do work with um, dogs that are sort of over fired up, um, even uh, a border collie that gets a lot of exercise or a lot of mental stimulation from um, their person might also still need some help sort of calming that down. They can get a little over revved up. You know, we do too. <laughs> we, we can get over revved up in our lives and want to control everything and like <laughs> bark at everybody all the time. <laughs> right. So the calming remedies can be really beneficial. Uh, I think of vervain a lot for those sort of very mental driven, um, focused dogs that want to run the world. Uh, vervain can kind of help calm that herding quality down and help settle them down so that they're not quite as over, um, over revved by the world. Uh, it's also really good to have a conversation with your pet. You know, when sometimes they don't understand what we expect their job to be. And they're thinking, they were thinking one thing, like my job is to manage the whole world that I can see. Everything outside of my house needs to be barked at. And everything that comes in or out needs to be barked at because I'm here to take care of everything. And if you can have just literally have a conversation with them as you would with a child, you know, at the same level, a uh, very simple conversation saying, you know what, I'm the adult here. I run the house. What I want you to do is this, this, and this. And then they can kind of start to go, oh, it's just a lot of responsibility to run a whole house. And they've just kind of taken it on themselves. What are some other ways? I mean, are there other techniques for choosing what essences to use for pets besides, um, you know, are they part of the process? How do they let you know what uh, what's going to be the right remedy for them? I love this question because it's so important to get the buy-in from the animal. The animals have an absolutely, you know, they've got all of their senses operational. And we've decided that the only senses are 
the five senses that we know. And animals can pick up on energies of things way more easily than we do. We think it's just a bottle and there's no smell and there couldn't possibly be anything that they could pick up on. But I'll tell you, if you show one bottle or another bottle of a closed flower essence, there's no possible way that they're picking up on anything except for the energy. And they can tell the two apart very easily. And a lot of times if you if you have the ability to show an essence to your to your pet if you've got it on hand and you're thinking this one might be the thing or this one might be the thing if you literally just show it to them and kind of put it up to their nose I'll, you'll find that they'll be very interested in the one that's the right fit and they will sort of like turn their nose or walk away or just show you they're not interested in the other ones it's wonderful to let your animal make the choice I've heard about that. And I, I watched a webinar that they did that with essential oils, actually um, a practitioner. Is, there's a, I forget her name, but she's an expert in working with animals with essential oils. And it was phenomenal. The videos, um, the way that the, the dog or the pet would, would go to the one that, that was for them. Yeah, I was just really blown away by it. So it's, it makes, but I, of course I was thinking at the time, well, you know, they they have such heightened sense of smell. They are using that to know what's right. So it was, it's really interesting to hear that they do that with flower essences completely based on the energy. Yes. I, when I first experienced it a few times, I went, Oh wow, that really does work because you know, they'll, they'll, I, with my own animals, because I have such a collection and I can sort of pull them out and show them to them, uh, I can just, you know, line up 10 on 10 on in my hand and sort of show one and he goes, nope, no, not for me. And then the next one, yeah, that's good. That's good. And you could just run through a, through a line of possibilities really quickly and easily uh, if you've got them on hand. If you, if you don't and you're looking for other ways of determining what flower essences your pet might need, you know, repertories are very helpful. Um, there are some good resources, and I, I know that we're going to put those in the, in the show notes of some books that are available on flower essences for animals. But it's really about the assessment process of why your pet is doing what it's doing um, and not just you know, essences for barking, because it's really useful to look at it, you know, get in your animal's paws and <laughs> see what might be happening. Um, why would they be doing this at this time, at this place? You know, really try to break down the behavior of this is happening only when somebody comes over. Okay, is it one particular person or is it anyone coming in your house? And each one of those little points is going to help you differentiate whether maybe your pet is doesn't like one particular person, which mm -hmm. could be a sign to you that maybe this person is a little sketchy or they could have their own reasons that, you know, this person reminds them of somebody they used to know that was upsetting to them. Um, and, and you work with it through that way. Or if they don't feel safe in their home and they feel like they're being constantly invaded, that's a different kind of a thing. That, that would be something that I would be thinking of using, uh, in essence, probably starting with Guardian you know, the Alaskan um, combination formula of guardian to help mm -hmm. them feel really secure in themselves and feeling really secure in their space because, you know, that's their home too. And they didn't open the door and let somebody in. <laughs> they need to know, okay, this person's just going to be here for a little while and then, you know, they'll go home again. The animals don't understand. I, I catch myself all the time not forgetting to explain what's happening to my pets. And I feel bad, like, oh, I should have just had a conversation to let them know, okay, this is happening now. We're going to go for a ride in the car and we'll be back. And, you know, I like to always explain when I'm leaving how long I'll be gone, when I'll be back, <laughs> and that we'll be back in time for dinner. Really important detail. Uh, those sorts of things. Talking to your animals is just such a, uh, please just do it. <laughs> oh my gosh. I talk to my dog so much. She yeah, I know people must think <laughs> if they were to ever hear me, it's hilarious. So yeah. Yeah. It's like, do we, why should, why should we care what they think? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, this, this is, this is a sentient being with whom I have a relationship and why on earth wouldn't you talk to them? Why wouldn't you? I know, them? right? <laughs> it's pretty crazy. What are some of the ways that you give the essences to, or apply the essences to animals? There, you can use all of the possible ways. Um, the 
easiest. And if you're working with an animal that you're, you know, this essence is going to be helpful them, for them for a period of time, go ahead and put it to give it to them directly. So directly could be you put a drop or two on a treat. If they'll take it from your hand, you can put essences in the drinking water and refresh that twice a day. That's a really good way to get essences into your pets. And also it's totally fine if your other animals drink that water too, mm. because the way the essences work is they they work on that resonance. So anything that's not a fit, it really just passes right through them and you really won't have any, any sort of contraindications or problems. You can just kind of put it all in the water. One of the really, really wonderful ways that um, a carer can help their animal is to, you know, if you're thinking about it, if you take essences yourself too, that's a really good thing. A lot of times these formulas are really wonderful to share if you've come up with a formula for your pet. So taking a, a drop as you give a drop or two to your pet as you hold them, as you give them a little treat, you give them some love. That's such a beautiful bonding experience. I remember I worked with a really interesting dog. He was a Mastiff and it, just a fascinating personality, very strong personality of a dog. And I, I had to work with her a little bit more on that because when she got the formula, he refused to take it. I'd never had that happen before. He wouldn't touch food that had it in it. He wouldn't take a treat from her, no matter how delicious the treat was with the drops on it. What changed his mind about it was when she took it too. I said, oh, okay, wow. sit on the sofa. <laughs> yeah, it was really interesting. I've never seen it before and not since, but he wouldn't take it until she took it too. So he was an interesting character and um, it was really quite cool to see how much apparently he knew that she could really use those essences too. But taking essences with your pet is really beautiful healing for both of you. So you can also, and this is something that's really nice with kitties, is if you're using the essences, you can put drops on your hands and pet them onto them. A lot of times if the kitty is a cuddler, that's a really beautiful way to get essences. They don't have to go inside the body. They're not, you know, it's not medicine, it's energy medicine. And so it doesn't really matter how many drops go in them. It's more how often you offer that, that energy to your pet. So usually I recommend twice a day and that's usually sufficient. Mm -hmm. But being able to sort of rub it, you know, just put it on your hand and just pet it into their field, essentially. You're just petting it on, usually I recommend the top line, you know, pet the head, maybe the ears and down the spine. It's really a lovely way to give essences for your pet. I made a, a glycerin um, flower essence blend and glycerin uh, recently for my dog. And she just absolutely loves, um, I put a couple drops on my, the palm of my hand and she loves licking it off the palm of my hand. And I feel like that's, that I'm getting it that way as well. Like I'm getting it topically while she's getting it internally. So it's a kind of a, ni a nice way to share that moment. And now, whenever she, she, I, it, it, this was just so great because whenever I pull out a little bottle with a dropper top, she's looking to see if she's going to, you know, get her medicine. <laughs> Isn't that sweet? It's they really, really do ask for their essences. They really do. Yeah. A lot of times they'll line up like, it's time for my essences. Thank you very much. And yes, being able to put it on your hand and have her take it from you that way, that's, that's really beautiful. And just, just, you know, I know that you, when you make a glycerin, it's not pure glycerin, no. but that's one of the reasons why a lot of times I use um, an alcohol preservative in my dosage bottles for animals is so you have the option of doing topical because if you're using glycerin, it, it'll make them pretty sticky and that's not really great. <laughs> yeah. The glycerin needed to preserve it is too much for a skin application for whether it's animals or humans. Um, in cosmetic formulation, 5% glycerin would be the max you'd ever put in a cream or a formula because it is so sticky. But um, about the alcohol formulations, uh, great for topical. Some people have concerns about that alcohol internally. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it depends on the animal. You know, if you're if you're working with a you know hundred pound dog, using um, a twenty percent preserved. 
uh, alcohol, you know, two drops or four drops is probably not enough to cause any issues. But if you are concerned or you're working with a smaller animal, having those drops be in their water bowl is, you know, very, it's a very, very low amount of alcohol. The alcohol is there just as a preservative to keep things from going funky in the bottle. Uh, so it, it is, does have to be there. Um, eat another option um, for the alcohol concerned would be to create a little tiny bowl um, with a few drops and of the formula and then just, you know, in a, little, in a little egg cup or something like that and just pour a bunch of water in there and stir it around and you've got potentized water and you can dip treats in that and then hand that to them. Mm. And that way they're getting a very small amount of, of you know, minuscule amount of alcohol, but they're getting the essences, mm -hmm. uh, which is the important part. Yeah. And you can also put it, put it in their food, right? It doesn't have to be the water. So that's another way to balance that out, that ingestion. Yeah. It's always, it's always a part of the conversation when I'm working with a client of, of their animal likes and what fits in well with their lifestyle of what's, you know, what's sustainable for them to work with over a period of time to get the essences into the pet. So each animal is really different. Some cats are incredibly picky and they only eat dry food and you don't know when they're going to eat it. And in that case, putting drops in their food is probably not all that helpful. I tend, to, I really like to have it be wet <laughs> and not have the essences dry out because um, I'm just not certain that they're going to get what they need if the essence is just kind of dried into a puddle at the bottom of the bowl uh, and they didn't really get them. Got it. Um, so that's kind of one of the concerns that I have in that sort of situation. In that sort of situation, you know, can you touch your kitty? If so, let's do topical. Let's let's pet it onto them. That's a beautiful way to give the essences. Another concern that I have with putting in the food depends on the animal. If you've got an animal like my little dogs who get super excited about dinner time, um, they go bonkers. They're not really in a calm receptive state. So the essences can kind of like bounce off of them probably. I try to give it to them at other times that they aren't quite so excited. Wow. I didn't consider that. That makes a lot of sense. How interesting. And the same thing goes with horses. You know, it depends if you're working with a horse that's you know, everything is a little bit of a balancing act. You try to do the best you can. A lot of times people who have horses don't, don't live with their horses, right? The horse is boarded out and they might see them once a day or perhaps even less often. And then we figure out, okay, what's the best route? You know, how often can we get essences into your horse? And if they need to be given to them by the carers and, you know, just putting some drops in the grain as they grain the horse um, or some other way, that's fine. But if the horse is super excited about grain and all the horses in the barn are going crazy because it's time for dinner, it's probably not the ideal situation. And we might try to find another way to get essences into their horse that way. What are some common issues that you see in your practice with uh, dogs, cats, and other animals? I think the biggest issue that I'm always on the lookout for is separation anxiety mm. because I think weaning trauma is a, a very, very significant problem, probably for all mammals. <laughs> and that includes human mammals, right? Uh, the Any sort of disruption in that bonding process and in the you know, leaving, leave, leaving the mother's breast and having to change into a more autonomous being, if that was stressful at all for the animal, it can cause lifelong repercussions. And I see separation anxiety as being a part of that issue. It's something that I've just, I've seen so often, I've worked with so often, um, it happens with dogs when you know, especially if the dog was in uh, some sort of a breeding program rather than in a home and, you know, the puppies were just force weaned, uh, even if they had other puppies to hang out with, it's still really traumatic. I see it a lot with um, horses, with racehorses. Fortunately, the, the 
breeders and I think the consciousness is starting to develop a little bit more and it's not as hard as it used to be. They, they don't force them as much, but it used to just be that, that they would just, you know, pull them away from mom and just haul them off to somewhere else. And all the babies would just be, you know, absolutely bereft and the mothers would be bereft too. It's, it's really traumatic. I, I worked with, um, for quite a few years, I was working with the local Bay Area Zoo, uh, working with some of their animals. And the way that the giraffes had to be weaned was literally, once they got to be too old, they couldn't even fit in a trailer anymore to get down the highway. Aww. And so they'd have to just pull them off of mom, put them in the trailer at a certain age when they were still quite young. And that was the weaning process. They just got in the trailer and then went to their home that they'd be at forever just because literally the height issue of not being able to fit into a trailer and not being able to go under bridges. So that was, that's the experience that a lot of giraffes had. I worked with a giraffe there that was the world's angriest giraffe. And, you know, her situation when she had been weaned, she'd been put in a trailer like, like happened and taken to her new home. And by the time she got there, she had kicked the, the trailer wall like, the entire way and arrived with an injury to her hoof and to her leg and then had all sorts of medical treatments to help with that, but was left, you know, just really pissed off at the world. And being able to offer flower essences to that giraffe and help her turn around, it was the most beautiful thing. Wow. Do you still work with exotics at all? Uh, I don't work with, I don't work with zoo animals at this uh -huh. point. Um, okay. but I'm always, um, available. I, I do work with birds. Um, I, I, in my early life when I was as a veterinary technician, I also worked for an avian behaviorist for parrots. And so I have a good amount of experience with parrot issues. I have, I have my own parrots as well. I have a gray parrot and a Myers parrot. And so those who enjoy listening to our show will probably hear noises in the background from time to time. Um, <laughs> Lady Kelly, the gray parrot, um, she just has so much fun talking back and forth to things like trash trucks and heavy equipment um, that beeping noise. <laughs> so so uh, we, have a, we have a construction project down the road from us and she's been having just the most fun talking back and forth to those trucks. Um, <laughs> so you'll hear that in the background from time to time as well as the other noises. But I just, you know, flower essences can help any kind of animal and it's just a matter of, of kind of digging into what's underneath the behavior and why they're doing it because there is a reason. It's not just some sort of randomly learned behavior. There's some reason why they're doing this if it's not a healthy behavior. What are some of your go-to flower essences, for example, for that separation anxiety or some of the other issues? Oh, yeah. I, I skipped right past that part because I think that that is a really important um, detail. You know, starting with Star of Bethlehem, always a good place to start. And that's one of the Bach essences. And, and Star of Bethlehem is such a wonderful, soothing essence. It really helps to calm and to help come back into yourself after some sort of a shock or trauma. And that can be any kind of a shock or trauma, whether it was that happened when the animal was six weeks old or whether it happened two minutes ago. So Star of Bethlehem, always a really good starting place. And then I really, really love um, Northern Lady Slipper, one of the Alaskan essences. It has this really beautiful um, quality of nurturing and soothing that is very helpful for any kind of disturbed gestation or early childhood experience. So a lot of times when you have mama kitties who are, you know, <laughs> only a few months old themselves and they got pregnant and they're on the streets and they're not getting enough food and they're stressed as far as they can be and they have some babies in their belly. Um, those babies will oftentimes come out and they'll be pretty stressed too, as one would expect. So Northern Lady Slipper is really good for those sorts of situations. Even if you don't really know what the life of your pet was before you got them, um, a lot of times that's part of the picture. So Northern Lady Slipper, really a great choice. Uh, also, Grove Sandwort is so useful. Once again, another Alaskan. It's just so soothing and kind of it, it just works so well with that, that baby phase, you know, where whatever was injured in that baby phase. Grove Sandwort creates softness and a nurturing 
that was so needed. And you can kind of reinstall that through the use of the essences later on. I would imagine that almost, you know, unless your pet was bred at home in a family and, you know, with its, you know, mother, uh, you know, they probably all have this going on. And I mean, I know what do breeders, is it eight weeks that they take the puppies away? I, you know, it's so short. It, it really shocked me when I found that out. There, there are, you know, it runs the gamut. Um, so there are wonderful people who are really trying to be conscious, um, and loving, you know, temporary parents, <laughs> uh, when they breed animals. And then there's lots of situations that are so far from being great. There are some really important, um, behavioral markers and developmental markers that happen for both dogs and cats. And if they didn't get the um, in interactions with their siblings, or if they weren't um, getting interactions, you know, safe and kind interactions with people at certain ages, they can kind of always carry those marks. Um, I think that, that it's, it's just something to realize that your animal doesn't come to you a blank slate. And sometimes they really do have kind of a constant challenge in the same way that we do. You know, nobody had a perfect childhood. Well, I haven't met too many that did. Uh, most of us have some work to do and the pets are the same way. And just being cognizant of that and getting them the help that they need, you know, is, is it takes you a long way down the road to healing. Yeah. And flower essences, I just really see it's part of that, the love that you give them. And they respond to it just like they respond to being loved. So this is really, this is so great to learn more about the specifics of how to do this. My pleasure. I just love, I love to share this with animals because they're just so responsive. It's so much fun to work with animals because the people can't deny the change. You know, yeah. a lot of times we look at flower essences and go, eh, that's sweet, but it's probably, it's probably just, you know, some sort of a, an effect that you know, sort of the placebo effect and, you know, and then you see an animal change and you think, okay, they don't know that this can't work. <laughs> and they all of a sudden have some big change. That was one of the coolest things about um, working with zoo animals because the keepers and the zoo animals have a very different relationship than people with their pets. They're not pets, right? They're the keepers and the keepers are trying to keep them somewhat independent, you know, attached to their, to their herd or flock or what have you, and not as attached to the keepers because they're not supposed to be pets. They're wild animals, right? But watching the, those animals changing with the essences was just undeniable. It was really beautiful to see. Yeah. Have you been asked to work with farm animals at all? Cows, sheep, goats, We've I don't, so I haven't, county, right? So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, totally. I'm, I'm totally open for it, but I have not had a lot of experience with, um, livestock. Let's say I, I tend to work more with companion animals. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. I think, I think that they could always use it and I'm sure there must be wonderful keepers out there who, who give essences to their, to their goats and sheep and whatnot, but I don't really know very many of them. Yeah, well, so it's probably a really underexplored, underutilized area. Um, you know, so many small ranchers and farmers have a really, uh, you know, really care about their animals and have a bond with them and would probably be really, I think, open to um, this modality and just don't know about it. So it's really interesting to think about. It'd make for a fun 4-H project, wouldn't it? <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. 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 So um, are, there, are there any other situations that you might think would be valuable to highlight with some of our companion pets, getting back to dogs and cats, that, and certain essences that uh, you might want to call out? Yeah, I think that, you know, we've talked a bit about dogs. Um, kitties are also very receptive and responsive to essences. I think that kitties really take on a lot of the energies of the people who live in the home. And so when your kitties start to act up, you know, think about 
sort of working with everybody in the household. It's, it's always really nice to work with everybody in the household anyways, but it can be really helpful with kitties. And you'll start to see a lot of sort of stress behaviors of, of kitty arguments um, with the other cats in the household and things like that when there's kind of an ongoing stressor. So I would definitely be thinking of using some essences for that. I think Holly is always an incredible essence for use with animals who aren't getting along with one another. Hmm. It's so helpful for releasing those frustrations and irritations of, you know, when you share space with others, they can get on your nerves. <laughs> and using Holly can really help to kind of open hearts and, and help everybody get along a little bit better and share space. One of the pieces that domesticated animals have, you know, ones that share our homes with us, they can often be really suffering from a deficit of nature energy. Mm. You know, especially if you live in the city and there's not a lot of opportunities for your dog to kind of run in a wild area or just to be able to smell the interesting things. You know, dogs are so smell oriented to, to be in a city could be really overwhelming and not enough diversity of smells. So I think that if you're thinking about that for your pets of, of getting some nice grounding essences, uh, I really think of the Kusa dogwood bud, which is one of my essences from Flora of Asia for kind of helping reconnect to the earth. Uh, oh. It's really beautiful. And especially since, you know, a lot of times now we really should be keeping our kitties indoors because they're very hard on the ecologies outside. They tend to be kind of excessive, excessively predatory to songbirds and lizards and small mammals in city environments that giving them something that helps to kind of reconnect them to the earth, even though they can't be outside in it, is really beneficial for their, for their bodies and their spirits. Um, so any sort of grounding like that Kusa dogwood bud um, or the grounding green essences from the Flower Essence Society is a beautiful, nice grounding essence. Anything, any kind of tree essences. And that would kind of bring me to working with the home environment itself, using different sprays in your home, um, not overdoing the essential oils, but the flower essences can be incredibly beneficial in a spray version and just kind of clearing your home of the just the day-to-day -day detritus of living in it and dealing with people and dealing <laughs> with spouses and children. And there's a lot of chaos that happens in a lot of homes and just kind of misting your home, getting the corners of it a couple times a day can really take a lot of the stress out of the space. What a great idea for everyone in the household. And we just probably want to reiterate that you don't want to use essential oils with cats or if you use it in a house with cats, they don't, they, they have a way to leave the room if it's overwhelming to them. And you want to be real careful with cats who uh, don't have the liver enzymes to metabolize essential oils like other mammals do. Exactly. Um, and that, and I think that that goes for every species, but particularly cats are very sensitive and also birds really useful to be thinking about what you're putting in your environment if you have birds. Uh, that's one of the reasons I just love flower essences. That was why I originally got into flower essences to find help from my birds. They're very temperamental creatures and being able to use flower essences to kind of help moderate their moods is really great. And you can just put some essences in a little misting bottle with water and just go ahead and, and mist your home. That's a wonderful way of getting essences in your space and everybody feels better. That's lovely. This is so great to hear this, all of this from you and get this sort of download. But you also teach classes in this. I do. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much to learn. There's so much that you can possibly do. And it's just, you know, so important to empower people to know that A, there are solutions out there and that you can use them safely yourself and help your own animals. Uh, I just, I love to share this, uh, this information with people to help them. So I do teach, um, I do have a class coming up in November, November 10th, uh, from one to four in the afternoon at Gathering Time in San Rafael. 
Gathering Time is a wonderful um, herb store and they have a beautiful teaching facility and it's a beautiful women-owned herb store uh, that's in the Bay Area, in the North Bay Area. And I just, I love to be there. I love the women there and I love teaching there because it's such a great space and teaching about flower essences for animals in that class. I'll be helping, uh, I'll, I talk about certain basic issues and I really love to get um, feedback from people in the class who have specific issues, and then we can really delve into what can help them and their pet. Yeah, and that's uh, an in person class only um, yes. in San Rafael, California, for those not in the Bay Area. So, um, anyone who is, that uh, these classes are just really great ways to get all of the information from Kathleen. Um, Really, it's just such a neat specialty that you have here with the with the pets and then also the horses and then bringing to to the table your background with working with exotics and doing the hands on and being a person that works with people <laughs> as well. <laughs> so that whole connection between pets and their people, I you know, I really love that. It, it makes so much sense when you think about it, when you think about the way that we are connected with our pets. I mean, we love our pets here, especially, I don't know, in this country and this time and space in the world, you know, they've really become a part of our culture. I mean, all you have to do is to walk into a pet store and see the millions of things that you can buy for your pets. And you know, you know, it's, it's a huge industry, um, yeah. but it's reflective of how much we just absolutely adore these animals that love us unconditionally. You can't replace that. It's it just that, that relationship is so beautiful. And I just, I, I can't imagine my life without having animals as a part of my life. They're, they add so much and they're, they've always been important to me. And I do love helping um, relationships be better between people and their pets and helping develop greater understanding and rapport um, so that we can all accept each other better and learn each other better and help each other heal. It's just, it's such a beautiful experience. Our animals are you know, they're just your heart and you are, will do anything for them. And sometimes they ask us to heal ourselves too. Oh, so beautiful. What, what a great talk and sounds like a perfect place to end this today. I, I just love talking about animals. So thank you for asking me. Thank you, Kathleen, again. And until next time. Until then. You've been listening to the Flower Essence Podcast with Urkana Feld and Kathleen Aspens, and we appreciate your interest in connecting with nature on a deeper level. You can find us online at theflowerescencepodcast.com or join us on Facebook and continue the discussion. This podcast is meant for educational and entertainment purposes only. We are not physicians and do not diagnose, prescribe, or treat medical conditions. Please consult with your own physician or healthcare practitioner regarding the suggestions and recommendations made by the hosts and guests of the Flower Essence Podcast.